Galatians chapter 2, I will read, I'm going to read 15 through 21, but we're just, I'm really going to key in on the first part of verse 20 today, but for context, we'll get verse 15. This is Paul uh, talking to Peter and, and others, particularly Peter. He says, we're Jews by nature. And not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through the faith of Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you for your wonderful plan, your plan not only of redemption, but your plan, Lord, to, to do your work in us and through us. That, Father, your, your manifold wisdom would be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities and the heavenly places. Father, we are so privileged to be a part of your ministry of reconciliation. We're so thankful that you have considered us faithful and called us into your service. We're thankful to be a part of your family, of your kingdom that endures forever. And Lord, we're appreciative for your word that it doesn't beat around the bush. That it doesn't try to make things easier than they are. But that you communicate with us in a very clear and open manner and tell us the truth. So we're thankful for Jesus and his crucifixion, and we're very excited, but also in a very real way, to acknowledge what it means to be crucified with him. I ask that you be with me today as I preach your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So the main point I'm working on today, as you can see, <laughs> that's weird, that just went out, didn't it? Try this again. I do not know. Uh, now I can't see anything. <laughs> That's not what you, I don't want you guys to see all of my stuff. Let me try this again. Let's try this. There we go. Uh, main thing I want to work on today is crucified with Christ. Now, this is, verse 20 is the main point, but I'm only preaching on the first half of verse 20. Okay? Some of you may be like, Luke, you, ne you didn't preach the best part. That's right. Okay? The best part of this verse, Lord willing, we will get to next week. Okay? But I do want to emphasize and hammer away at the first part of this verse today. And I would strongly encourage us all to, to be engaged in this because there is a natural tendency for, over a period of time, for people to get complacent. And what does the scripture say? The complacency of fools shall destroy them. So I want us to really consider Galatians 2 verse 20, awesome verse. But the first part of this, I have been crucified with Christ. Before we get there, a few other things I want to hit. The question of, is Christ a minister of sin? The point that we have died to the law and then get after it on being crucified with Christ. You know, Paul asked the question here. Is In verse 17, he said, If while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? This is a little tough for me to, even though I've had Galatians memorized, to track through what, what's he driving at. I even asked my, my pops, went to the, the old man Q&A 
and said, you know, what, what do you think the thrust of, of this section means? And if you, these are my words, not his, okay? So he, he helped me understand it, but I'm not quoting from him here. So if I don't communicate it clearly, you can take it up with me, not with, not with Mr. J. Wilson. But there is a, there's an obvious contextual difference between pursuit of righteousness by the law or being justified by faith. And so in that, in that contextual context, or in that contextual contrast between the law and faith, the Apostle Paul says, we're Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. So the Jews growing up, they know the law, and there's, a, there's an attitude that kind of came with the Jews of self-righteousness. So we're not sinners from among the Gentiles. But he said, nevertheless, knowing a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through the faith of Christ, we ourselves have believed in Christ. And, but then he asked this question, if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we have our, ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? And the, and the answer comes back, may it never be. What's he talking about? In the process of becoming a Christian, when you're sharing the gospel with someone else, or when you, you can go back in your mind and you think about when you chose to become a Christian, along the way, one of the first things that has to happen is you have to realize that you have sinned. All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. And there is a natural tendency of human beings to say, okay, well, that's, it's everybody, it's, it's the other people, it's the really bad, it's the murderers, it's the rapists, it's the child molesters, it's the whoever, whatever that category is, those are the people that have been separated from God. But God's always heard me. Not true. So part of the preaching of the gospel, the beginning part, actually there's a purpose for the law here. If while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? No, Christ is not a minister of sin. Christ doesn't turn you to the law. Christ doesn't turn you, but the law is, there's, and there's a purpose for this, as I said before. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 says, the sting of death is sin. And the second part of that says, the power of sin is the law. Sin actually gains power through the law. You can read more about that in Romans chapter 7. Is the law good? Yep. Is the law holy? Yep. Is the law righteous? Yep. What happened then? Sin took opportunity through the law. Sin used the law to actually to make you a sinner. To pin you up against the wall as a sinner, to put you into a cycle of guilt and shame. Sin used the law to do that. Maybe if I could use a quick analogy. Are guns bad? Well, if you're on the liberal side of the political, you, oh, guns are, guns are terrible, all these mass killings. The problem's not guns. Matter of fact, guns, I... They're neutral, but I, I kind of like to put them on the positive side. They have a good purpose. What's the problem? The problem is when evil people use guns to do evil things. The law is not bad. But sin uses the law to manipulate you. To, and in the process, sin becomes utterly sinful. Christ is the minister of righteousness. Okay? Through the righteousness of the one, okay? through the obedience of the one, of, of Jesus Christ, the many shall be made righteous. I'm thankful for Christ. As a, he is not a minister of sin. He's a minister of righteousness. As I said before, the law has a purpose, has a part, though, in bringing people to Christ. You, it's essential. I don't care if you're a Jew or a Gentile. It's essential that you get pinned to the wall and you have to come to a realization that you have fallen short. I've mentioned this example before. Julie and I Bible say with a, a gal in Billings, super nice lady. 
one of the sweetest ladies I've ever met in my life. And we're talking to her, presenting the gospel, and we get to sin, and she basically doesn't think she's, she's a sweet lady. What's wrong with her? So at the time, she was living with a guy and wasn't married to him. I'm like, well, can I show you something? Okay. Galatians chapter 5, the deeds of the flesh, the first one is immorality. You don't make it past the first one. This really sweet lady, you don't make it past the first one in the list. Okay. What's the purpose of the law? To turn you to it and make you face the reality of your problem that your sins have separated you from God. That's the purpose of the law. And it's essential as we get to the gospel. It has a place. But after a person becomes a Christian, are they under the law anymore? The law is not made for the righteous man. The law points to you and says, sinner, sinner, sinner. Christ, when you're in him, is going to give us a whole new picture. And we'll work on that a little bit today. The, the law is called the ministry of condemnation, ministry of death. And it's important because you don't ever solve a problem by avoiding it. I'm thankful for the law. I'm thankful for being pinned. The example uh, I think my dad uses in, in the Planet Salvation booklet is the scripture shut up all men under sin, according to Galatians chapter 3. He compares it to, to being put in a jail, the jailhouse of sin. I remember as a kid going on a field trip to the jail. And I remember the doors slamming shut. Okay, they let you in there and then the doors... I'm not... I wasn't in there, in there. Some of us have spent time in there, in there. Okay? But you aren't getting out of that place unless they let you out. The purpose of the law is to help people understand that you aren't getting out without the Savior, Jesus Christ. The New Testament, in contrast, is called the ministry of righteousness. And so every person in this process comes to a realization. Okay? It's not that Christ is a minister of sin. It's the law points out to us our need for a savior. And so then he says, okay, if I rebuild what I've once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor through the law. I died to the law that I might live to God. If you turn back to the law after you've been in Christ, then what are you doing? You're turning yourself back to the image of a sinner. You're proving yourself to be a transgressor. We don't want to do that. We don't want to rebuild what was once destroyed. We don't want to go back to the law. Romans 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that, that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we've been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so we serve in newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Okay? I'm not preaching much per se on this today, ex except to make the point here. The law is never going to bring about righteousness within you. Thou shalt not. What it actually, I like the way he says this here. The sinful passions get aroused by the law. Lots of ways, lots of images you can, can get in your mind in reference to that. One of my favorites, a guy who, uh, this guy was a, a professional thief. He stole from JCPenney. I used to joke this guy made more money. When I sold shoes in JCPenney, I was by one of the exits. This guy made more money off our store than the store manager did. And this guy was, I don't know how he never got caught, because it's not like he was taking little things. He'd take stacks of jeans at a time. So I, I recognize this. I'm there. It used to be fun. They used to let us chase those guys a little bit. Um, but one day, he's, he's there, and he's trying to, the, you know, you have the stacks of shoes out. And the stacks of shoes, when they're most of the time they're in the back, but you get some out. They have a, there was a bunch out, so you just it's easy access to them. I come around the corner and I see this guy who I recognize as a thief, and he's on the 
on the ground where those boxes of shoes are. I know what this guy's doing. So I just, I kind of snuck up on him and I said, something I can help you? And he was like, you know, oh, I, I, don't have my, I don't have my pennies card. I said, well, they can give you one back there in the, but I rec- this guy was like this. This guy was getting a huge rush off of stealing. The sinful passions, don't, thou shalt not steal. This guy was getting a rush off of stealing. The law never going to work. Why would we as Christians go back to that? Thou shalt not. All it's, all it's going to do is paint a picture in your mind of what you're not supposed to do. So we don't go back to that. If I, if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. We've been made to die to the law. There's a lot of people who don't like, who are afraid of this. Now, wait a second. If you remove the thou shalt nots, people are going to break them. We're talking about Christians here. And and I just want you to bear with me for a second. Let's take our current society, people out here in the world. Do they need... Do they need some heavy-handed law? I'll just take people of Belgrade. The people of Belgrade need a police force. Yeah, they do. Do the people in Billings need a police force? And I follow up a little bit Billings since I used to live there. There are there are nightly shootings in Billings. Some of those big gangs. I've heard there's some. The world needs the law. Freedom, the. The idea of freedom in just a, in a general sense, less government, more individual responsibility, that, o- that only works for a moral people. As William Penn said, men must be governed by God or they will be ruled by tyrants. And so there's, this, there's a tendency to say, okay, wait a second. We can't remove the law. If we remove the, the law that keeps us in the proper boundary then Christians are going to go lawless. Well, if you can go lawless, that's true. But then you're not being led by the Spirit. But the solution, brethren, is not to have the laws. We were made to die to the law. There is a big difference between law and faith. Faith, as I said last time, is, is image-driven. It's a picture given to us of God, ultimately that of Christ. He's going to say here, he's going to talk about being crucified with Christ. And before we talk about being crucified with Christ, go with me to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus summoned the multitude with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. How many of you think you got a good feel for what Jesus means by that? Raise your hand if you think you got a good feel for what Jesus means when he says, pick up your cross and follow me. How many of you would have had a good feel for what that meant before Jesus was crucified? When Jesus, you got to realize, Jesus is saying this before his crucifixion. They're probably scratching their head. What what is this guy talking about? Pick up your cross and follow me. Before we can talk about us being crucified with Christ, we got to see the example of Christ's crucifixion first. They wouldn't understand until after Jesus was crucified. One of the best messages I ever heard Steve Doty preach. It was in Ohio. I actually was going to go back and listen to it because I, I liked it so much, but it's no longer available on the recordings. I think it was from 2016 Ohio Family Camp. But he, he talked about, I think it was, he had been in Vietnam, and uh, one of their tour guides was with him. And then he, of course, Steve's talking about Jesus. And they're, they're going somewhere, and he says, the lady asked him, she's like, I just... I just don't understand something. Why did he have to die that way? So Steve said, and he actually had a picture. He and her sat down on the bench. Everybody else went on with the, the rest of the group went on with the tour without them. 
And he talked about, why did Jesus have to die that way? In other words, why couldn't Jesus have just died in that storm that came out while they were in the boat? Why didn't they just capsize and he died that way? Why didn't Jesus, you know, just get waylaid and, or, and maybe even, why didn't they just stone him to death like they did a normal Jewish uh, execution? Why did he have to die that way? I, th I think it's worthwhile us thinking about this because the scriptural principle is we have been crucified with Christ. Now, one of the things I notice, guys, in fake Christianity, fake Christianity is always trying to run away from the hard statements that Jesus makes. Fake Christianity is always wanting to mark the price down because people don't really want the real thing. I appreciate, one of the things I appreciate most about Jesus is he, is, he doesn't beat around the bush. He is up front with what it takes to be his disciple. And he says, you're going to pick up your cross and follow me. So what does that look like? Well, first of all, what it look like with Jesus? He had a painful death. Okay? The matter of fact, the word excruciating. Well, what's, what's the middle? Cruce is in the middle of that, isn't it? Okay? Our word excruciating, extremely painful. Okay? It's associated with the crucifixion of Christ. The, what we might call his, I like what Jim said. I'm going to take, I want to take this with you before I suffer. There's going to be some suffering. And Jesus knew that he was headed for that. Matter of fact, he's talking to guys on the road to Emmaus. And he says, you know, don't, don't you guys remember from the scriptures? That the Christ would have to suffer these things and enter into his glory? In, in a very simple way, I'll say this. The road to glory is paved with suffering. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. The road to glory is paved with suffering. Anybody read 1 Peter lately? Basically, if I could summarize, it tells you as a Christian how to be happy while suffering for doing the right things. Elliot read the, the end of Romans chapter 8, and right before where he picked it up, the verse before that says, we are being, for his sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. There is a reality that Jesus is very upfront about, and that is if you are going to follow him, you are going to suffer. And he's the ultimate example of what this looks like. I, so I just want to lay out a few things of Jesus' crucifixion. For me, the betrayal would have been one of the, one of the most difficult things. I'm a relationships guy. Jesus spent all this time, invested, poured his heart and soul into these guys, and Judas... You're going to betray him with a kiss. The denial. Denial of Peter. Never knew you. Peter, you said you have my back. When it came down to it in crunch time. Oh, and the rest of them, where were they? They all fled. Not an easy thing to go through. Jesus is going to go through this by himself. Well, he has the Father with him. What about the trials? Any of you had to testify in court for any reason? Maybe because you got in trouble or somebody else? Or I've had to testify in court a few times. And frankly, at the time, it wasn't my favorite thing to do. I got a little nervous beforehand. You're in there. The, you know, they, they make you Take the oath that you're going to tell the truth. You have to say some things. And, well, some things maybe are writing on your testimony. Guys, I've never been there, in there, where I'm either going to be judged guilty or not. Jesus going through these trials, and it's, a, it's such a staged setup. It's such a kangaroo court these guys are so, this is where evil people go. These guys are so far ahead that they anticipated Pilate offering up Jesus to release, or I mean Barabbas, to release him or to release somebody to release Jesus 
I'm sorry, uh, as in, the, in accordance with their custom, okay, turn this guy loose yearly on a yearly basis. They anticipated Pilate doing that, and so they already had plants in the crowd that said, Barabbas, Cru- Jesus, crucify him. Okay? They, they were ahead of this. The whole thing was a setup. Jesus knows that I have to endure those trials all night long. And not to mention the beating, okay? hitting him in the face. Scripture, Old Testament tells us they spit on him, okay? getting smacked around. Then the scourging. I actually think the passion of the Christ probably does a pretty good job of, oh, that's extreme. That's over the top. There's a, a verse from Isaiah chapter, I believe it's 52. It might be a couple chapters earlier. But that his, his appearance was marred more than any man. They basically beat Jesus beyond recognition. Now, when, you, when that happens, okay, and these guys weren't limp. These are the Romans doing this. They're not limited to the 39 lashes. That was the Jew. Okay. These guys can give however many they want. Okay. When you are being whipped like that, well, I think that back being ripped apart, okay, the whole nervous system back there, what do you think starts happening to the body? It starts going into shock. It, wants, it starts shutting down. And now they're going to make him pick up his cross and carry that. It's a three-hour trek. This, it's been a while since I've done a, a three-hour trek. Jesus carrying, the body literally shuts down to the point where they have to get someone else to help him carry the cross. And then the cross itself, being those spikes being driven in, Nailed to the cross. And then the picture of the cross being dropped down in the hole. When you're on it. That back exposed. And then the death that comes. The agonizing death that comes from the cross. Where you are slowly suffocating. Why did he have to die that way? Is there any relevance for us? Well, it doesn't say when, that as Christians that we died in a shipwreck with him. It says we've been crucified with Christ. So I want to talk about our crucifixion a little bit. How are we crucified with Christ? Maybe ask this question, can you crucify yourself? Did Jesus crucify himself? No. Did Jesus have to be a willing participant in that? Yeah, actually he did. He said, I have authority to lay my life down. He had received that from the Father. There were options for Jesus to get out along the way. There are many offers, even up the last minute, for for Jesus to get out of that. He had to willingly participate, but he didn't crucify himself. The same way with us, we have to willingly participate But our crucifixion happens at our immersion into Christ. Go with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6 verse 1. What should we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? May it never be. How should we who died to sin still live in it? Brother, I want to pause here for a second. I might be getting a little ahead of myself. But if we're still living in sin, something's wrong. If, if we still got the same, we're still tripping over the same stuff that we were five years ago, that we were 10 years ago, that we were 15 years ago in Christ, something's wrong. We're missing something. Now, is it possible for that to happen to Christians? Yeah, I've read all the New Testament letters. There's a, there's a reminder for the Romans, the Roman Christians here. Don't you know? Hey, can I remind you of something? What's the solution going to be? Let's get out with the commandments again. Thou shalt not, thou shalt... No. That's not the solution. He asks a question here. Verse 2, may it never be, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Verse 3, do you not know that all of us 
who have been immersed into Christ Jesus have been immersed into his death. Therefore, we've been buried with him through immersion into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. We are immersed into his death. Our old self was crucified with him in the waters of immersion. Now, can you crucify yourself? No. Matter of fact, the scripture never tells you to immerse yourself either. It says be immersed. God's doing a work there. But we have to participate in that. I've, I've often wondered, and where I, where I actually pursued this a little bit, I had a debate with a, a guy on the topic of immersion, a, a pastor at New Life Church in Billings. We were supposed to have a big debate, didn't end up that way. But when I was preparing for that, my kind of closing that I put together is, why do people want to avoid what the scripture so clearly says about immersion? And I came up with three reasons. I won't spend time on all three of them today. But one reason that I thought of that people fight what the scripture says about immersion is a lot of people want forgiveness of sins and not many people want the sinner to die. When you say immersion is an outward sign, of an inward grace. Doesn't that change the picture a little bit from a crucifixion of the old man? If, if the only goal is to get people to, to plunge them under some water here, how easy would that be to do? Churches baptize all the time. I have all sorts of people I could baptize into Christ. Well, I could baptize into water. But if they don't want the sinner to die, then they're not getting immersed into Christ. Immersion into Christ is a crucifixion of the old man. Apart from this, everybody's still dead in their trespasses and sins. Apart from this, the picture that the law is, if you haven't yet been immersed into Christ, then the law says you are a sinner, and that's where you stand. You stand condemned. When a person's immersed into Christ, we are crucified with Christ. In the process, we die to the law. Faith's a picture. Just out of curiosity, what do you see here? How many of you see a there's a couple ways to ask this question. I'll ask it this way. How many of you see a, a young woman? Okay. How many of you see an old hag? Okay. How many of you see, can't see both? <laughs> okay. Some of us see both. But there, there is, if you cover this up, you can kind of see the, the young woman here okay. from the a side view. Okay. Otherwise, you open this up, Here's the, the nose, the old, I, I've heard it said, is this your wife or your mother-in-law? But I figured I'd try to say that a little different way. Okay. But what, what do you see here? There's a paradigm. People have paradigms, the way they see things. And when we looked in the mirror prior, prior to being immersed into Christ, we used to see a sinner, and we sh that's, what, that's the only picture that was there. Okay. And the law points that out very clearly to us. What do we see now? I'm not preaching so much on what we see now today, but I'll just put it this way. If you're in Christ Jesus, you're a saint. If you're in Christ Jesus, you're a holy one. If you're in Christ Jesus, you are righteous as he is righteous. That's the picture that's given to us. That's more than a paradigm shift. That's actually something real. It's a spiritual reality that God did for us when we were immersed into Christ. Now, I why am I hammering on this? Why is the Apostle Paul even, he starts off saying, I have been crucified with Christ. This important part of the picture. Visit the morgue. You go in there, 
You peel the sheep back. Can you tempt that person? That's a dumb question. Of course you can't. Why not? Because he's dead. You know, I, I had a grandpa. I got to speed this up here. My Papa Bill. He's a cowboy. Lived his life as a cowboy. Poor cowboy. His whole life. And Papa Bill was, a, among other things, he had some good qualities, if we want to say it that way, but he was a womanizer and a boozer. Kind of typical cowboy lifestyle, actually. He got divorced because of his womanizing, and probably, and never could get the first wife back because of his boozing. But this guy, this guy died in a, I'll just say, assisted care facility. This guy's outer man was decaying. He didn't have the ability to go out and get hammered like he used to. Do you know, even in that place, the guy's inner man was still decaying. He's still being inappropriate to the women who are in there. But once, once Papa Bill died, you take anything down and you visit him when he's dead, you can't tempt him anymore. He's dead. Anybody in here that's been immersed into Christ, I just want you to remember your immersion. Why'd you do it? Did the old man die? Some of those sins that you were held captive by Satan to do his will, were you excited for the freedom to be liberated from that? If, if you still going back to that, you know, they, some of those thinking patterns and habits are very deeply ingrained. You know, when you pop up out of the water, I've been crucified with Christ, those habits don't automatically change. It's going to take some work, brother. It's going to take some pain. It's going to take some ongoing participation in, the, in your part to continue to lay aside the old man. I'm having to free will it here a little because I'm running out of time. But I want you to think about it. You were immersed into Christ. You said, I want the old man to die. Go back and grab a hold of that picture again. I have been crucified with Christ. The old man is dead. Six feet deep. Is that how you see yourself? Our picture dictates our actions. I'll come back, follow up on this next week because I get to preach the second half of this, the positive side of this. But worldly behavior, brother, we don't act that way anymore. One of the things that, I, that really bothers me about so-called fake Christianity today is I can't tell the difference between fake Christians and worldly people. They do all the same stuff. They swear, they cheat, they're greedy, the rich man, the midst of his pursuits, faith, all this stuff the world does and all these people who claim to be Christians, I can't tell any difference. Can people tell the difference about you? If not, why not? Go back to the picture. Okay, go back to the picture. Picture will dictate what you're willing to do about that. Okay, that isn't me anymore. That man is dead. So many times in the world we're told, just find yourself. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus says, deny yourself. Lose yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. In Mark's account, Jesus says, he who loses his life for my sake and the gospels shall keep it. The apostle Paul said, I do all things for the sake of the gospel that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Is that who you are, brother? What, if you were to look, what's your time? Time priorities. Is it for the sake of the gospel? Money priorities, is it for the sake of the gospel? Or are you still pursuing your own dreams, your own life, your own wanting to get the American dream, wanting to get it while you're here, eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die? That's for people who don't have any hope in the resurrection. 
We got something a lot bigger. It's the Lord's purpose. We confessed Jesus as Lord. We said, Lord, we want to do everything for you. I would, I would encourage you, if you haven't done this in a while, start every day either quoting Romans 6, 1 through 11, or if you haven't memorized, maybe start memorizing it or read it every morning. This is who you are. I'm only giving the first half of the picture today, but that old man is dead. And it's going to take some work. Faith, why do we do the things we do? Well, it depends. If you do it by law, it's not going to be meaningful. But if you're doing it because the picture of who you are, the old man of sin is dead. So why am I still participating in some of these things? Why am I still having outbursts of anger and punching walls? Something's not right in the picture. So I'm willing to go back and go to work on that. Find the scriptural solutions because I know that is not consistent with who I am. It's not who God has made me to be. Christ isn't a minister of sin. Brother, we died to the law. Rules aren't going to get the job done. All rules do is they, they hold you within the confines until the pressure's too big and then it busts open. I have been crucified with Christ. That's the key pic- first half of the picture. Brother, we die to ourselves. We all experience this a little bit in a, in a very simple way. It's a dumb illustration, but before I got married, I didn't, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I think I'm a, fairly nice guy, but actually even when Julie and I first got married, we go through Wendy's drive through and I'd order my stuff, she'd order hers, and I'd order a large fry, and she wouldn't order any fries, and then she'd want to share fries with me. No, these are my fries. So I had to tell her, like, if you want, if you want fries, I'm happy to buy you your, your own fries. You want fries, just say it, let's buy two fries, two sets of fries, right? Because these ones are mine. And, and she figured out, she learned quickly, order two sets of fries. Okay? But then kids come along. I, did, I didn't like to share s- stuff, like drinks and that kind of stuff. Then kids come along. And I, every time I turn around, whatever it is I'm drinking, it's got floaties and everything else in it. <laughs> it's like, who cares? <laughs> what, it's, a, it's a dumb illustration, but what am I? I'm dying to myself for somebody else. There's somebody more important than me. Brethren, we die to self for the sake of Christ. Why are we willing to put forth our money? That we otherwise could save a little stash here and, and find a way to have maybe a, a better retirement. Those, why are we giving 10% minimum to the Lord? Why would you do that? It's his anyways, and we died to ourselves. Why would we stick our neck out? And talk to people about Christ when there's going to be some rejection. And they're going to talk, oh, you're the Bible thumper. And whatever else goes along. Because we died to self. Why do we keep going back and following up on people that they're dragging their feet over becoming Christians? Sometimes, guys, it takes Bible saying with somebody two, three years before they become a Christian. And some of them don't make it. Why would you do that? Because you do all things so that you die for you to yourself. Why would you overcome some of those sinful habits? Because I want Christ to be glorified through me. I want his name to be magnified and honored, not a reason for people to blaspheme his name. Something bigger than me. We die to ourselves, dead to sin. Next week we'll get to alive to God in Christ Jesus. Brother, grab a hold of this picture. We will win one more 2024.